Hi, Misha here. And first off, we greatly appreciate your patience. This is a video that we teased back around the 4th of July for this rifle here. A German Stungewehr STG. 44, also known as MP43, MP44. This is really the world's first true assault rifle, as the name is properly used, assault being storm rifle, meaning it is select fire. That's your safety. And then your selector is, boy, it's always weird when you do these things and weird things. There you go, sorry guys. I'm at a weird angle. It can be selected semi or full. It is a reasonably lightweight, quite compact with a 16 inch barrel and fires a cartridge that's as revolutionary as the gun itself, eight millimeter curves or eight by 30. Three. And uh, these were manufactured in the last years of World War II and mostly deployed on the Eastern Front. And they built over 400,000, so they did crank them out. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the history and development of this gun, its usage, mechanics, all that good stuff. Also talk about some other German guns it served alongside, including the MP40 and MP38 submachine guns and 9x19, 9mm Parabellum. And a gun really developed at the same time. It's funny when this is actually, I think, the lightest one. The uh, Gewehr 43, G43, or Carabiner 43. But it cha is chambered for 8 millimeter Mauser 8x57 and these two were produced towards the end of the war we'll talk about all that and more the German kind of army way of doing things and uh, yeah just kind of get into this a bit so with that let's uh, jump on over and get to me rambling about this uh, weapons history well, before we get into the MP44 itself, let's set the stage 1930s and early war Germany. I've laid out a few common guns. This is the same MP40. And this is an earlier production Carabiner 98. Okay, and this down here is a Walther G41, formerly G41W, but this, <clears throat> this was actually adopted, so the W would get dropped. The, uh, the idea of an intermediate cartridge is was not new even in the 1940s the first inkling this might be something worth looking into came about in the 1890s by various arms inventors designers creators but this is the early days of the smokeless powder round so the idea was more accuracy longer range so in world war one the Gewehr 98 was germany's standard issue infantry weapon. It was supported early on by the P-14 so-called artillery Luger which was kind of a predecessor of a submachine gun. It had the the snail drum and a buttstock and a long barrel and then in 1918 they would introduce the MP-18 the world's first mass-produced submachine gun although of course 
the Villa Perosa from Italy really should be given this, but the MP18 was the, really the first one to be successful, thanks in large part by the 9x19 cartridge. But uh, anyway, after the successful introduction of the MP18, a few in the German military did suggest in the spring and summer of 1918 to think about going to an intermediate cartridge because studies had shown that combat in World War I was 400 meters or less. So 9mm parabellum wasn't quite strong enough to get out all the way sometimes, but 8x57 Mauser, or 7.92mm, was frankly overkill. But not much went. They had the MP-18, they didn't want to do things, and of course the war would soon end at, at the end of the year. 1923, the Weimar Republic started to consider how to replace the Gewehr 98 as early as 1923. It basically wanted a weapon that was shorter and lighter than the Gewehr, and at least out to 450 meters. And the idea of a self-loading war rifle was tossed about in the 1930s, but in the end, those who thought it would lead to waste and be too expensive won out. Therefore, the Carabiner 98K was adopted as standard issue in 1934-1935. And it really is just a shortened Gewehr 98 with a 23 and some change barrel. It does have some features taken from the Carabiner 98A. It also has the updated sights. But basically, it was the same 5-shot bolt-action 8mm. And these were produced in large numbers, of course, during World War II. And the idea was basically these rifles would be used to support machine gun emplacements. MG-34s, later mg 42s. The machine gun was kind of key. Well, a short time after, this weapon's immediate predecessor was adopted, the MP-38, and it was based on the MP-28, which itself was based on the original MP-18, just further evolutions. And the big difference between the MP-38 and the MP-40 was that the MP-40 went to more stamped parts. It was streamlined for mass production. It used a magazine, 30 rounds, double stack, single feed. Had a barrel just under 10 inches. Underfolding tubular stock. And even though it's not terribly light, this thing is over 8 pounds, about 8 and a half. It was very compact for its day and time, and it was also quite easy and cheap to mass produce. Really its biggest attraction was with the magazine it inherited from the MP28. That single feed wasn't awesome. <clears throat> so going into World War II, that was basically what the infantry had, of course, in addition to pistols. Ideas had kind of been tossed about for a self-loading full-power infantry rifle, as I said. But it was really in 1941, after the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, they really saw firsthand the SVT-38, SVT-40 in action, as well as the PPSH-41, and they really liked it. Quite a few Russian... Weapons were captured and reissued to Germans. And this really spurred the development of this gun here. In 1941, after kind of dawdling around, they would finally contract Mauser and Walther to develop a full-power self-loading, in other words, semi-automatic only, rifle. And uh, the German requirements were pretty interesting. They didn't want a hole in the barrel, so no gas port. That's why it has this uses the bang system. It has a gas trap in the front. 
has a full length barrel like a K98 especially when you consider the length of the gas trap so it's about 23 inches has a cleaning rod under the barrel takes the same bayonet as a K98 full length handguard same sling has a fixed 10 round mag machined receiver it operates using an annular gas piston which is a ring around the barrel which pushes the bolt carrier back the bolt itself actually uses locking flaps much like the Russian DP light machine gun full length stock with a cupped Mauser style butt plate like in the Mauser submission was just too complex they only made about 7,000 many of them either were never fielded or were fielded briefly and then returned but the Walther design was actually adopted in 1942 it went from being the prototype G41W to being the G41 and it's really hard to get production numbers on these but it seems like on the low end 40,000 and on the very high end 140,000 probably the truth is somewhere in the middle the reason why we don't know most of these were thrown into the meat grinder of the Eastern Front in 1942 and 43 so either didn't survive or just locked away in some deep dark very cold basement in Siberia today so we don't know the problem with this gun it's very long very heavy only 10 shots and this bang system that essentially the Germans insisted upon easily fouled up and had to be cleaned every 50 to 100 rounds soldiers liked that they had a semi-auto of course but the size weight and added cleaning were a bit of a pitta plus fixed magazine that had to be topped off using two five round stripper clips and these cost more to make than the K98 so it was clear that the G41 was not the answer but the MP40 on the other hand was doing great um, early on I'm not gonna say it was the best submachine gun in World War II it wasn't but it was definitely <clears throat> better than a lot of the others of the time especially on the production front so where does the MP44 come in in the late 1930s Intermediate cartridges were tested by the Nazis right before their launch of uh, invasions throughout Europe in 1939. Several were tried. There was a 7 by 46 millimeter, an 8 by 46 millimeter. There was even a 7 by 39 millimeter and a slightly larger. 7.75 by 39 millimeter. All of these gave the benefit of lighter ammunition, but still capable of getting out to three, four hundred meters with good accuracy, and were more controllable in automatics versus the full 8 by 57. But again, it was a low priority. Eventually the government would get more involved and the 8 by 33 cartridge was selected and this was a bit of a compromise cartridge it was a little fatter had a little larger diameter than they were hoping for but it allowed them to use much of the same tooling to make the ammunition and guns as a millimeter Mauser the 33 length was kind of chosen, you have to think, based on the U.S. American M1 carbine cartridge, which is 7.62 by 33, which was very new in 1940-1941, but it's an interesting parallel. Now, the U.S. cartridge only had a very, very slight taper, but the 8mm Kurz cartridge, as it was known, was a true bottleneck. So with that in mind, we pretty much have a cartridge picked out by 1940-41. Two companies were kind of 
chosen, given contracts to develop something for it. The new rifle needed to be select fire, needed to be good out to at least 400 meters, needed to be shorter than the Carabiner 98 and no heavier, needed to ha be able to be select fire and have a rate of fire not greater than 450 rounds, so controllable. And probably more importantly long term, it needed to be straightforward, in their words, straightforward, easy to mass produce, even with unskilled labor, and it needed to be easy to repair, maintain, service in the field. Also, they wanted to be able to take a bayonet, like the K-98, and be able to launch rifle grenades. And the two companies chosen were Walther, Carl Walther, and Hennel. And both were to have 50 prototypes ready by early 1942, with the new model known as the MKB-42 for machine carbine model of 1942. The Walther would of course be W and the handle would be of course H. And um, yeah, Hanel had their first ones ready by January of 1942 and Walther was just a little behind in February. So what did they come up with? Well, not to ramble on too much since I don't have a MKB-42 to show you. <laughs> Both used a tilting or tipping bolt. The Walther used an annular gas piston not unlike that seen in the G-41W. The Hanel, on the other hand, used a long stroke gas piston. On the other hand, the Walther fired from a closed bolt whereas the handle fired from an open bolt. Both designs were shown to Hitler on April 14th, 1942, and he wasn't impressed. But he didn't just outright forbid the program. So it did go forward. It was given to the School of Infantry in Germany for testing, and uh, they reasonably well liked it. So much so that 4,000 of the Walther and 8,000 of the Hanel MKB-42s would be produced, most being sent to the uh, Eastern Front to be tried out in the field to get real-world uh, feedback. And then again in February of 1943, after incorporating a few improvements, Hitler was again shown the machine carbine, and uh, he again just wasn't that impressed. In fact, he would suspend all future rifle developments, but he would let the program continue as kind of a thought experiment. He gave it six months, essentially. His appreciation was more for this Walther, the G-43. This is the replacement for the G-41. The biggest difference, they took basically the short stroke piston from the Russian SVT-40 and incorporated it, getting rid of that stupid bang system. This allowed the barrel to be shorter at 21 inches. Early versions like this are threaded, got a short cleaning rod. They also deleted the bayonet lug because it wasn't necessary, cut back the wood. Most importantly, they went to a detaching 10 round mag and would issue a total of three with most guns. They also made a scope mount as standard for sniper's use. Still have a traditional butt stock with semi pistol grip and now we have a trap door and the uh, 
stock for storing spare parts cleaning kit it's spring loaded so it's hard to meet on the camera here but yeah trap doors there and the um the G43 was a wartime element. It was kind of made from a rough cast receiver. It didn't receive near as much spit and polish as, uh, you know, like a pre-war carabiner 98 would. But it was still designed to be accurate and long range and to replace the Mauser. The original G41 was produced by Walther. BLM, primarily BML, BLM made the most. Walther would make these, as would Gustav Work and BLM. The, K, uh, the G43 would um, first appear in prototype form in 1943, and it would go into production in October, but they only would make about 3,000 that year. But this is what Hitler... really liked, as well as many others in the general staff. <clears throat> and it's not 100% crazy that they were kind of ignoring or disdainful of the MKB-42 at this point. It's a very new concept, but also consider it required a whole new cartridge, whereas this was firing the standard round. They already had the MP-40 firing 9mm to be kind of the... Uh, close-in fighting gun. They had plenty of K98s. MG42s were coming online. And the, um, the MKB-42 was going to require quite a few new pieces of tooling and equipment to build because it was not built with any kind of high degree of um, machining forging involved. This was Really the first German gun to really just be built to be built. Meaning that it would be stamped steel. That would either be pinned or welded together, sometimes riveted. The barrel would be pinned into a trunnion. The trunnion itself was just kind of a rough forging. And uh, yeah, it was just kind of built to be mass producible. Which is easy for workers to do but on the other hand required quite new tooling. So they were very mindful of diverting resources in 1942 and 1943 to a new project when they had already so many others on the table. So many were backing Walther's G43. However, feedback from both soldiers in the field and uh, testing and evaluation units in Germany was very positive about the MKB-42, so much so that it could not be ignored. So, with soldiers and testers trying out both the MKB-42W and the MKB-42H, most all agreed they preferred the design from Hanel. And it's worth pointing out here that Hugo Schmeiser was the chief designer kind of over everything at Hanel at this time. However, there were a couple of elements that um, were not necessarily liked about the Hanel. The fact that it fired from an open bolt being kind of the number one complaint. This version would soon, after a few more updates, be designated MP43A. And a closed bolt version of the handle would be designated MP43B. And basically what they do, they would take the fire control system and the closed bolt from the Walther and just stick it in the handle. So not dissimilar to kind of what they did with the uh, <laughs> the G43 taking the gas piston from the SVT40. Yeah, needs must. 
and it was this version that would really kind of go ahead. So at this point, Walther's kind of out of the game. You know, they've got the, the G43 to worry about. But then they have a ticking clock. They realize that Hitler's going to give them about six months, ending in September, to you know either wrap the program up or have results. Well, the, the MP-43B becomes known as the MP-43-1, Roman numeral I. And then they decide that they can use essentially the same grenade launching system, rifle grenade system, from the K-98 with it. They go to a stepped barrel and they redesign the front sight and this is when the name just MP43 goes into use dropping the the one and these have started to be produced in June kind of a pre-production series of 1943 and very quickly a couple of thousand are rushed to the Eastern Front for further field testing Well, September comes, and some decisions are made. They were trying to potentially make this into kind of a one-size-fits-all gun, either to basically to replace the K-98 and MP-40. They finally decide they just they can't do this, that this is not going to be a K-98 replacement. It's going to be more like an MP-40 replacement, but even then, it still fills a different role. So this has decided to become a K-98 supplement, and by extension, a G-43 supplement. And so this is when the bayonet lug and grenade launching ability are pretty much dropped. Also, they would drop the scope mount. The original MP43I would have a scope mount very similar to the one you saw on the G43. This just didn't have the range to warrant a telescoping a telescopic sight. It was good to up to 600 meters in controlled single shot, and out to about 300 to 350 meters in automatic, depending on how much they just kind of let loose. So it just really wasn't a thing. They were starting to get an idea after nearly a year of feedback from soldiers what this could be used for. But then, their time's up. Luckily, they had won over many, of course mostly field commanders, and also those in the government, some of them, including the Minister of Armaments. And beginning on September 30th, he started to really work on Hitler. And between him and everyone else, they win him over. So in October of 1943, Hitler orders 30,000 of the new MP-43 be produced every month. And then the Waffen SS starts to field these in the Eastern Front at the end of 1943. Now, a few little improvements and changes were introduced, but pretty much at this point, by late 1943, the MP-43 is the final design. So why the name changes? Well, after a few more product improvements and manufacturing in improvements, in April of 1944, Hitler signs an order changing the name to MP-44, Machine Pistol 44. And then in July of 1944 is that very famous meeting between Hitler and his Eastern Front commanders where they asked for more of the new rifle. And it's 
a complete fabrication that he did not know this existed. He allowed the program to continue multiple times. He had been aware of it, but he had not seen the MP43, MP44. He had only seen late MKB42 and early MP43Is, the ones. So he was demonstrated the most recent production version in July of 1944, and finally he was uh, suitably impressed. Now keep in mind the war was going a very different direction now, and Hitler was um, starting to kind of lose it, frankly. <clears throat> but anyway, he got very excited, and you'll notice this is something Hitler, he's uh, subject to mood swings, going from hate to love and love to hate. But now he very famously loves the gun, wants them produced, orders that, you know, one and a half million get ordered, there's plans to have four million in service, blah, blah, blah. Production is going on at Hanel. They make the most, at about 185,000 total. Also, it started at Sour and Sun, Erfurt, and it's even done in Austria at Steyr. And then, in late 1944, Hitler famously coins this as the Storm Rifle, Assault Rifle, hence the name STG-44. Now, some have claimed that actually this name came about because of Goebbels. But either way, it was definitely a political, a propaganda move. And for once, it was kind of warranted because this was new. This was not a machine pistol. Now, people have also said that they kept the name MP43, MP44, to hide it from Hitler. This is absolutely not true. It was actually to hide it from the Allies. Because when it was named MP43, MP44, uh, intelligence just kind of wrote it off as a um, wartime version of the MP40. There was also an MP41 submachine gun. And since they knew it was made kind of from rushed stampings and everything, they just thought it was a cheap and simplified Woodstock MP40. They even thought it fired 9mm. And I would say that was probably the biggest secret behind it was the 8mm Kurs cartridge. The intermediate round. It allowed a soldier to carry more ammunition, control than an automatic. Still was reasonably accurate out to practical ranges. And there's a reason that pretty much all militaries issue so-called assault rifles firing an intermediate cartridge to this very day. So what do we have here? Well, this is a long stroke gas piston gun with a tilting or tipping bolt. We have a 16 and a half inch barrel. Gas pistons on top of the barrel. This is just a stacking rod barrel. Muzzle is threaded. Front sight protector, same as on the G43. Very simple metal handguard. All this is pretty much stampings with a forged trunnion, adjustable rear sight, stamped receiver. Anyone who has an HK G3 or set me, you get the style. Mag release here, very similar to the uh, mag release on the uh, MP40 as it happens, almost identical. The recoil spring is in the stock, kind of like a lot of machine guns. Pistol grip was finally standard. The lower housing here is stamped, often made by a subcontractor. Early versions were blued, military bluing, but later ones that actually have some or even all phosphated parts. And to help protect it from corrosion, there is a dust cover over the Ejection port door. And again, we have a reciprocating charging handle, but it is on the left side, freeing up the shooter's hands. The G43 
is 44 and a half inches long and the new MP44 is 37 inches long so quite a bit shorter on the other hand the G43 is about nine and three quarters pounds unloaded whereas the MP44 is roughly ten and a quarter pound unloaded going over eleven pounds when the thirty round magazine is fully loaded up so while it is short it's actually very heavy for what it is but when you consider that an M1 Grand was the same weight and weight did help keep the recoil down all that good stuff well with that in mind let's um, let's take this thing apart look inside at what uh, what makes it tick so as far as the layout of this gun it's actually pretty modern as, you, as I kind of showed you at the beginning, the selector switch is here. It's a cross pin. Very easily to get to, but also not so close that you're going to accidentally switch it. Your safety is here, this thumb safety. Again, very modern, very kind of reminiscent of HK. Charging handle is on the side. It does reciprocate, but it's on the left, which is pretty good. Got your leaf sight here and adjust just like on a lot of guns, including the AK. Up here is your gas tube, stacking rod, front sight protector. I believe it's the same one or extremely similar to the one used on the G43. We have a threaded barrel with a spring loaded detent here very AK style although not the th same uh, thread pitch obviously this one has the step to barrel no scope mount on this one and uh, disassembly is pretty <clears throat> conventional oh yeah the mag catch it's a large push button here no paddle they hadn't quite got that far yet but still not bad for that era Here's your 30 round mag Much like on an HK, you have a push pin here in the back with a spring-loaded retainer. I brought a little pin because these can be a little sticky, just like on an HK. So you just press that out. It's a little bit larger pin than an HK would have. Very similar styling. Put that in my pocket so it didn't roll off. Then your buttstock just pulls off the back. Now your recoil spring is actually nested inside your stock as you see here. Pretty long spring. I'll show you that before I get a little closer. The uh, this sits inside there. Very, it always reminds me of a uh, machine gun. The way they did it. To take your trigger, I mean your bolt grip out, you just. I meant to cock that before, but I'll cock it now. That's easier. You just pull that out. And uh, that's pretty much it. The um, trigger group does hinge down, but it's riveted in the front. And this is just the sheet metal shell. <laughs> Nothing really left to see here. That's pretty much all of your, um, your guts, aside from the trigger group. As you see, the bolt and carrier 
<clears throat> aren't really joined physically. What happens is this has little fingers going forward and then the bolt takes gas from the piston. It's a long stroke and then it pulls the bolt back. And the uh, hammer comes up here, striking the firing pin extension in the uh, in the carrier. It's right here. It moves back and forth. It's not spring loaded. And uh, got a typical firing pin here. Pretty small bolt. For uh, cleaning and maintenance, there is a tool in the buttstock that you can put in this little hole up here. This end piece just unscrews, giving you access to the front end of the gas tube. The uh, sheet metal handguard simply is held on by friction. You can just pull it down and off. I don't like to do it anymore than I have to, just because every time you do it, it gets a little looser, but it's just held on by friction. And then from there, you can quite easily remove your uh, your gas tube to fully clean the front end. So yeah, about the only thing you just can't really easily remove is the trigger group. And again, it at least does hinge down so you can get to it. But yeah, pretty much all just stamped and welded and whatnot with the only machined parts really being the barrel and the... Uh, bolt and piston which are pinned together unlike on an AK there's no flex it's just all one piece pinned together and again unlike an AK this is not a rotating bolt it tips in and out of the recess in the trunnion to lock up and unlock there we go here's just here's the storage compartment in our buttstock Right here, it's got a takedown tool there and a small little rolled up manual. Kind of the old, let's see if I can get that out. There you go, that's your disassembly tool. There's also a, a small mag loading tool that can go in here, but I don't have that. But I have the manual in that, so I consider it a luck. So the end of this is just wood with metal end pieces. All right. Well, now let's uh, let's get to the uh, relatively short but still nevertheless important service history of the MP44 STG44 at the end of World War II. I'll go on from there. So yeah. I would say that they met the goal of making it straightforward and frankly simple quite well. There's not a lot unnecessary on this gun, especially after they deleted the scope mount, grenade launching capability, and uh, bayonet lug. Some will have wood grips like mine, others have Bakelite. But pretty much all had the wood stock. There are a few minor variations, different lengths and whatnot. There's also a few minor variations between the MP43, MP44, and STG when it comes to the front sight and thread protector. Here's that uh, K43, much like with the changing of the name on the uh, Stungewehr, the G43 saw its name changed in 1944 to Carabiner 43, K or Car 43. Not much else changed. This is a late production Walther. They went, they stopped threading the muzzle. 
simplified the barrel a wee bit. Actually improved the gas system somewhat. Um, <laughs> they decidedly simplified the bolt system by taking away the takedown catch, making reassembly fun. They also went to a manual dust cover versus automatic. They simplified the butt plate, taking the ribbing out. Mostly little things. These two would sometimes start to get phosphated parts. And of course, took the MP40 away. Thought I'd turn up the K98, the good old gun. This would be produced all the way through the war too. This is my Russian capture. I brought it out because I always think these don't get enough love. I thought when they were coming in they were a great way to get yourself a authentic gun with a lot of neat history for not a lot of money. One of the biggest changes for these would be going to the um, cup to butt plate. <clears throat> and as you know they would also simplify a lot of small things. But this never ceased to be the standard gun. They would build about 402,000 of the GK-43s. And they would actually produce about 425,000 of the MP-43-44 STG-44. And you know, both really went into production about the same time. So once they got these set up, they were able to turn them out quite quickly. And even though it was a new round, they were able to produce over 800 million 8mm Kurs cartridges. As you can imagine, in late 1944-1945, the major issue with these was ammunition, also spare magazines, became a bit of a deal. But the guns themselves, thanks to kind of straightforward design and intentionally loose tolerances, proved to be very reliable. In fact, some soldiers claim this was the most reliable small arm they had. Certainly more than the G43. They just worked. And that includes being in mud or snow, being frozen. These were used during the Battle of the Bulge. But most of them were sent to the Eastern Front to try to stall the Red Army. And of course many were used in the defense of the Reich. And even the defense of Berlin. And even though Hitler saw this as one of his many wonder weapons, of course, small arms only are a small part of an army. Bombers, fighter aircraft, and just overall logistics are always going to be more important. But, that does not take away from the fact that Germany did turn out the world's first production storm rifle, assault rifle, and it was a damn good one for being what it was. And I think one reason it was so good is that they had to make it good because they were fighting against Dafur, at least early on. So they knew if they were to have any chance of putting this into production, and they also had a lot of feedback from not just generals, but guys on the ground. So this was made to be an infantryman, a soldier's rifle. And not much time at all was spent making it pretty. It was a weapon of war. <laughs> and a testament to how good it was, even though production ended in April of 1945 as the factories were overrun by the Allies, these remained in service, in some cases up through the 1980s. That's a testament to how good they are and also how durable, because obviously spare parts weren't really available aside from what was captured in Germany. West and East Germany would deploy these, use these after 
World War II, of course under tight supervision from their overseers. Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia would use these for a time in the late 40s. Poland would also use these for a time in the late 40s. France would actually issue the MP44 in quite large numbers in the Foreign Legion, which is how so many ended up in Vietnam, where they were captured and then used by the Vietnamese in that war. They also filtered through Africa, the Middle East, and many were kept running for a long time with the big shortcoming being a, the ability to find the ammunition. Now looking at my notes, it's kind of funny. <clears throat> of course, everyone assessed this after the war. And I pretty much say in the notes to myself, you know, as I'm kind of figuring out what I want to say here, the British criticized it. They had this thing about, oh, if you just have it sitting against a wall and knock it over, you'll bend the receiver. Because, oh, it's just cheap, cheap steel. I think they thought this was like the same kind of metal that tins are made from. I mean, it's really thick stamped steel. Anyway, that was their criticism. The U.S. acknowledged its positive attributes, but also said it was kind of primitive and clunky. And they also said it was heavy, which is a valid complaint. Of course, the U.S. is fielding at this time the M2 carbine, which is nearly an assault rifle in and of itself. And then when I talk about Russia, I say Russia looked at it and made the AK. Now, I've done a whole video, it's been some time now, talking about just how much Schmeiser and the STG-44 influenced the Kalashnikov. But it's undeniable that they took this and they ran with it. Now, it was mostly its 8x33 cartridge. By 1943, Russia had already captured quite a few of the rounds and directly, if not copied it, cloned it to make their 7.62, originally known by 762 by 41 later 762 by 39 And uh, so, yeah, I think Russia, more than most, saw the the benefits of this. And then again, they also went up against it more than the Allies. In, um, in East Germany, this was known as the MPI-44. It was used by their army and even the police through the 40s and 50s until it was replaced by the, uh, the AK there. West Germany, too, would briefly issue these, as I said. There, it would be replaced by the FAL, known as the G1, and eventually the Heckler & Koch G3. And again, if you can really look at this, and you can see inspiration that the G3 took. Now, it's worth saying here that the G3 is more directly based on the STG-45M, which was a late war attempt by Mauser to make an even easier, cheaper, and faster to produce version. They used the roller lock system from the MG42, but it still used the kind of stamped and welded receiver setup, trigger housing, 8mm cursed cartridge, and all that from this gun. So, you know. But yes, yeah, some nations, like I said, kept us in service through the 70s and 80s, and really only retired when they ran out of ammo, and the guns lasted that long. Pretty good for a cheap gun that could easily be dented, apparently, when knocked over, right? <laughs> and of course, today it's just iconic. As I said, Hitler wasn't just dead set against it for no reason. He was concerned about introducing a whole new cartridge, magazine, everything into the supply chain when he knew the Reich was already stretched. On top of that, he also knew that just putting a couple of thousand in the field wouldn't do any good. He wanted to have as many as possible when he launched this. But of course, by the end of the war, needs must in a defensive war, so they ended up kind of deploying it earlier than anyone had really hoped. So he had practical considerations, but it doesn't change the fact that his intervention did probably delay the whole program 
by quite a bit of time. In fact, if Germany in general had taken the, the intermediate cartridge more serious, they could have had this, if not before 1939, probably very close to it, because the basic tech was there. It was only because of political reasons that this was delayed to 1943-1944. But the same can be said about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Neat gun. It's also worth pointing out that Hitler's preferred G43, K43, really didn't influence much of anything. And they never really got the gun to work 100%. At least their their solution to make it work was just overgas the hell out of it, which meant it would work, but longevity was an issue, which the British tested and proved themselves. Proving that the MP44 was indeed the future, and that's why you can see lines of this, elements of this, in everything. The AR-10, the AK, the FAL, the G3 set me. Everything. And of course, the good old K98. If nothing else, they're a lot of fun to shoot. And about as good as a bolt action uh, bolt action military rifle gets. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know that I'm no expert on the MP44, STG44. But um, this one came into my possession. And uh, it's kind of one of those grail guns that uh, you're always happy to find and yeah but it has a lot of place in history and it's also a very uh, very good gun and of course we're going to do more with it in the past we did a comparison video with the PTR-44 the replica and the Kalashnikov AK Type 3 I want to do a video really comparing this to the Armalite AR-10 to see just how many features from this were carried over to the armor light. Although you saw from the disassembly that there are definitely some. Anyway, I hope, uh, hope this was worth the wait and hope you enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to question or comment below. And if you'd like to um, <clears throat> help support our channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. As always, Jay and I greatly appreciate you. And please tune in again next time for hopefully another modestly interesting video. This is Misha, and we'll catch you then.